Hi, welcome to the third Danish academic research webinar. I'm Henry Christensen. I'm a professor at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm a Dane by birth, got my education there, worked in Denmark for a number of years before I went out into the world. I'm the recurring host of this webinar series. We've already had two of these seminars. We started out in a winter at the Southern Danish University. So their research, then we drove north to Albor to see what is going on there in the very northern part, um, where we saw dancing, we saw assistance to daily people, we saw um, manufacturing, so quite a different portfolio of this. Today, we're going to just outside of Copenhagen, to Lyngby, to the Danish Technical University. Long tradition of very fundamental research and applied research. Um, we're going to go and see both the academic research they're doing there in terms of electrical engineering, computer science, human factors, but we're also going to see some of the very recent acquisitions of modern research infrastructure that helps their research overall. The overall theme is autonomy today. Our local host is Professor Ola Raum. He is the chair of automatic control. He is also the section lead for automation and robotics there. I promise you, you're in for a treat. So Ola, over to you. Thank you very much, Henrik, and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, library at the Technical University of Denmark, where we have an action-packed program for you this evening. Uh, the introduction was uh, excellent, and the program is also uh, excellent. I'm Ole Raun. I'm a professor in intelligent robotics uh, at uh, the Automation and Control Group, which I'm also heading, and I'll guide you through the program tonight. So uh, welcome. Let's have a look at the uh, program for tonight. We start out by uh, having an introduction to DTU. We've had two of our 11,000 students uh, show you around. Then we'll move on to give you an insight into some of the fantastic robotic facilities that we have at, at DTU. And then we'll move on to the research topics. And we have five interesting research topics that we'll go through with some of the top researchers that we have in our group. One of the other vital uh, activities that we do at DTU is that we compete. We go to any or all robot competitions that we can uh, lay our hands on, and we have a a short video on that a little bit later. And then finally, we'll come back here to the library to answer questions. So uh, please be sure to post uh, questions on the stream uh, in YouTube. Uh, we will have uh, try our best to answer them online uh, or at the end of the, uh, of the show. So, uh, Bringing this uh, introduction to, uh, to a close, I just want to thank everybody in the automation and control group for uh, participating and contributing to this uh, show. And then uh, let's get started with a video on uh, DTU campus. Hi, I'm Chennai. And I'm Nick. We're both students here at DTU. And we're excited to show you around the DTU main campus. Campus situated in Lyngby in the greater Copenhagen area. This is our library. It's a nice place to study and situated right next to our bookstore. It's also an ideal place for group work, which is a very big thing here at DTU. Everywhere you go around campus, you'll notice that there are students working together in teams and collaborating on different projects. We also have a lot of exhibitions and events happening right here in the library. So this is the new chemistry lab. DTU has something I haven't seen in any other university in the world, and that is how easily accessible all these great facilities are. And if you're ever stuck, well, you can get help from all the technicians, professors, and postdocs in the labs. Now, we are in the DTU Skylab. The DTU Skylab is a really cool innovation hub, a place where you can prototype, test, and bring your own ideas to life. 
Personally, I'm a huge fan of the human-centered design thinking mindset here at DTU. Why? Because we solve some really, really serious global challenges around the world. And as an added bonus, there is so much synergy between the students and companies here at DTU Skylab. More than 32 master's programs are represented here at DTU, all focused on finding solutions to real world problems. There's a strong connection to sustainability. And here at DTU, students and staff are working on improving sustainable energy systems for renewable energy sources. Now we are in this really cool futuristic sound lab. This is an example of some of the state-of-the-art facilities DTU students have access to. Whether your study line is in biomedicine, mechanical engineering, or sound and acoustics. You can tell DTU invests a lot into their buildings to create the perfect environment for research and education. DTU also offer a variety of interdisciplinary studies where you get to take your projects all the way from a 3D sketch to a real-life model. And here, we have students building all sorts of things. A good example of the balance between the theoretical and practical courses offered here at DTU. You have the freedom to pick and choose and specialize in the area that interests you. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to this beautiful building, the Biosphere. It's basically a big hub for health tech, research, and education. It's where they develop technologies to be used throughout the healthcare sector. And it's also my favorite place to grab a cup of coffee. That's all from us now. We hope you got a really good idea of what the campus looks like and also got inspired to learn more about DTU. If I should sum up why you should come to DTU, it's you're given the freedom to study whatever you like. And on my part, I would say the biggest plus is access to world-class facilities. Since its foundation in 1829, DTU has been dedicated to developing the natural and the technical sciences with a view to creating value for society and is now ranked as one of the foremost technical universities in Europe. With a research profile characterized by depth, innovation and impact, the university is at the academic forefront within the technical and the natural sciences. DTU continuously invests heavily in state-of-the-art equipment and facilities, ensuring that its research, teaching and learning environment is one of the best in the world. This embraces, for example, three supercomputers, including the Computer Realm with 16,048 CPU cores that can store 7.5 petabytes of data. And Echoic Rooms that enable the simulation of reflection-free acoustic environments. This is highly useful for loudspeaker measurement, noise emission studies, studies of attenuation and diffraction of sound and also for creating an artificial listening environment where all the acoustic properties are determined by the experimental setup. The plan to develop the university's infrastructure includes the construction of new buildings, extensive renovations and conversions, and the equipping of new ultra-modern laboratories and research facilities of the highest international standard. The plan to transform DTU will allow us to carry out research, innovation, and education at an even higher level and support our expressed mission to serve as a driver for growth in Denmark. So we're back here at the, the library at DTU in these nice surroundings. And with me uh, in the other chair, I have uh, Roberto Galeazzi, uh, one of our associate professors uh, and also the head, uh, the head of the newly opened Center for Collaborative Autonomous Systems. Yep. So welcome, Roberto. Thank you, Ole, and uh, welcome to everybody here at DTU for this uh, outstanding uh, exposition of our research on autonomous systems at DTU. So, Roberto, first of all, tell our viewers what is an autonomous system. Well, an autonomous system is a, a system that uh, is able to self-determine its behavior, a, a system that then uh, will be able to act in a meaningful manner in the environment where, uh, uh, so to say, the environment is a part of, and they will also, it's a system that then uh, is able to do so by, by evolving and learning and thereby uh, acting uh, in environments that are changing for a long period of time. Uh, a, an autonomous system is characterized by some so to say, important features, the ability to perceive and understand the environment where it operates, the ability to uh, dependently interact with the cyber-physical system that is a part of, and as I said, the ability to evolve through learning such that uh, it will always be capable to, uh, so to say, face new challenges. 
Autonomous systems are uh, widely spread uh, in society. Of course, uh, many of us nowadays are uh, familiar with the concept of self-driving cars and autonomous robots. But uh, here at ETU, we are pushing, uh, so to say, autonomous system to a new frontier, to a new dimension, because autonomous systems will play a very important role in energy systems, in domotics, in manufacturing, of course, uh, as well as, of course, in asset management and condition monitoring. So robotics is, of course, uh, probably one of the first areas where autonomy, so to say, has been spoken, but uh, these characteristics will, are becoming uh, pervasive in many other uh, systems uh, uh, in our society. Thank you very much for that uh, clear explanation. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the ideas behind making a center for collaborative autonomous systems? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question, Ole. Well, uh, DTU is coming uh, from uh, more than two decades of intensive research on autonomous systems, and uh, we see that uh, as uh, these technologies are becoming more important for the development of our society, also towards sustainability, uh, it's important to have a, a, an entity that actually brings together the different aspects of the research uh, some of them, of course, are very much technology-focused, like uh, research in electrical engineering, computer science, and space technology. But uh, we see that there is a, a very strong importance in addressing also technology-related issues mm -hmm. that comes from uh, the uh, integration of these systems into the societal context. So how do we see autonomous systems, of course, uh, to be, become a part of an organization? And how do we see autonomous systems actually to work shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with, uh, with humans? So the center actually has the ambition of uh, pushing the frontiers of autonomous systems uh, technologically, but also for uh, social, economic and regulative aspects in order to really uh, enable the uh, pervasive deployment of autonomous systems uh, in, the, in the society. And uh, where are we in a year? Well, in a year, uh, I see a, a vibrant environment uh, on the Center for Collaborative on Systems. Uh, we have the ambition of establishing our uh, first flagship project within the second quarter of 2021. So, of course, now the researchers that are contributing uh, to the center are uh, working hard to, to scope the uh, most uh, uh, compelling and appealing uh, research areas that can... Uh, so to say, really conjugate these different aspects, uh, technological and, uh, and organizational, uh, in order, so to say, to, yeah, to really bring forward the, our agenda and to, to generate the first results uh, with new projects, new exciting projects. Thanks a lot, Roberto. Uh, now we'll uh, move on to the uh, robot-related facilities that we have here at uh, DTU. And do you remember to ask questions uh, also while the video is running? So uh, let's see the video on uh, robot-related uh, facilities. Hi everyone, my name is Matteo Fumagalli, I'm a Master's Professor in Robotics at DTU Electrical Engineering. Uh, today I will show you our approach for developing new autonomous system technology that works in real life. At DTU, we perform research and innovation on autonomous systems, and for us, testing is a key element for the innovation process. One of our goals is to ensure that the research that we do has an impact on society and the industry. And in order to be able to ensure that, we need the facilities for testing in near real life conditions. One of the most important facilities that we have is called the uh, Autonomous System Test Arena. We call it ASTA. And that is a big air dome of the size of 42 times 24 times 14 meters. It is an inflatable structure that allows us to have near outdoor conditions when we perform experiments. We have uh, natural light, we have access to mobile communication networks such as 5G. We can combine near outdoor condition with indoor measurement systems. We have access to GPS coverage, but we also have a 3D tracking system in a big volume inside the facility. We can test uh, autonomous systems that operate 
in three different domains, aerial, ground and water domain. In fact, we have a pool with salt water where we can also emulate current in the water flow. We have several nets that allow us to have uh, three different segregated test volumes and uh, they can be adjusted to provide uh, also one single volume depending on the needs of the experiment that we are uh, performing. And in any case, we can test while keeping potential audience that is looking at the experiment. Our goal with the facility is to ensure that research on autonomous system has an impact on our society and the industry. Our research is carried out in a tight collaboration with the industry, where our goal is to solve real-life problems and provide economic and societal benefits. With the Autonomous System Test Arena, we provide our students with a unique facility. This facility can be used by students, by researchers, and also by our industrial collaborator to ensure that the outcome of our research and the technological development is applicable on the field. We use this facility to perform tests on our autonomous robots. In particular, we have used it for developing and tested our system for participation in international robotic competitions. In this other demo that I want to show you, we have an aerial robot that is flying autonomously and a user that from a remote control room can guide the aerial robot in order to perform a certain operation. So what you see here is our researcher, Ananda, who is controlling from control room the drone. He gets a stream from the camera of the drone and he can select a point where he wants the drone to touch and perform an inspection. And the drone uses its own autonomous controller in order to perform the operation safely and gather the measurement that is of interest for the user. In this other demonstration, we have an underwater autonomous robot which is performing inspection task. So the underwater robot autonomously maps the environment and gather data with sonar and with cameras and the data are streamed to the user through the umbilical of the robot. And then a unique element of this facility is that besides testing technology in each separate domain, we can also test technology collaborating all together in a shared environment. Finally, the Autonomous System Test Facility is also a way for us to get in closer relationship with our industrial partners. They can use our facility, they can test their technology in there, they have access to our instruments, and we can support them to develop their technology. Our autonomous system test facility works also in close collaboration with Skylab. Skylab is a facility for rapid prototyping that is available for students and researchers at DTU. The Autonomous System Test Arena represents our way to guarantee that the technological gaps that the industry is facing are filled up through our research outcome and the students that we train.
So a big thanks to uh, Matteo for giving us that uh, sh uh, short tour of our, our excellent facilities. And now we'll turn uh, to uh, look a little bit at, at some of the research projects that we do at uh, DTU. It's only a limited number that we can have at this uh, webinar, but we picked a few and we hope we, you will enjoy them. So the first video will show uh, Autonomy at Sea, uh, presented by uh, Professor Mons Blanke. And uh, when we come back, we will have a chance to uh, ask questions. So if you have questions, please post them on the YouTube channel. So let's see the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Mons Blanke. I'm professor in automation and control. We have a major research activity in autonomy at sea. This is Roberto Galliesi, who is leading one of our projects, and I'm leading the other ones. Why do we want to do autonomy at sea? We would like to avoid accidents, here collision with a bridge, here collision with two vessels. We would like to aid the navigator in his decisions, help him to make the right decisions on time. And at the end of the day, we would also like to be able to demonstrate that the navigator is not on board, but the computer takes over the steering. The research topics to achieve this are situational awareness, it's false, sovereign data association and sensor fusion. Sometimes replanning is needed in order to avoid a collision, and we do that as well. As a very important safety aspect, we have autonomous supervision as an important research topic. Architecture with sovereign ages protect against cyber attacks, and cyber resilient navigation is also an aim in the research group. We have several partners from industry and academia. Perception is an important part, and this is data-driven research. We have our autonomous sensors on the foremast. That includes camera, electro-optical sensors, different radars, and we do data collection at day and at night. Part of the important problems in object detection is tracking. That is instrumental for detection and for sensor fusion. And the following video shows you bounding box around objects that are detected with an identifying name. You can see some vessels are crossing each other, but the tracking algorithm still keeps track of which ship is which. When we go to the awareness that is based on sensors and sea chart, then the red boat that you saw before is now here on the sea chart, and this is a recording of actual measurements. Two of the buoys are on the chart, but are not seen by the radar. And one of the buoys here, and others, are seen by the radar but are not on the chart. So we must be prepared for the unexpected when we make autonomous systems. When we want to get from awareness to evaluate, to replan and to execute, then a situation like this easily occurs. We have our own ship that is blue, we have two other vessels. In order not to collide with this vessel, we need to follow the traffic rules of Colrex at sea and go behind this vessel. So we need to do a short time planning. At the same time, we avoid this vessel. We want to avoid that any of the vessels are forced to run on ground. When talking about coping with the unexpected, look at this small slideshow from the real world. What's the small yellow boat here behind the ferry? It'll come up here, and one would expect, according to the traffic rules, that it should go to the port of our ship. But according to the opinion of the master here, we have plenty of space between the two vessels. So he has a high maneuverability and turns in in front of us and passes at a close distance. An autonomous system should not command a full stop here and make an emergency breaking of our own vessel, but be able to realize that this is a behavior that could be allowed since this was safe, even though it's at close quarters because we are in shallow water. We do this by the autonomous supervision structure. We have an autonomous supervisor that monitors for defects or unexpected behaviors that should act in place of the human navigator, that should execute if not in doubt, and call for a human proxy if in doubt. It should also enable remote maneuvering control through a plan by control that would also communicate with shore. We are a team of people who are doing this very exciting research and we are grateful for the funding from Innovation Fund, the Danish Maritime Fund, Orient Fund, 
and the Lauritsen Foundation. What we want to obtain in this project is to demonstrate decision support on a large vessel. This is compatible to SAE level 3 for cars, that means human in the loop. And we would like to demonstrate on an autonomous harbor bus, SAE level 4, human on the loop, expected to look like that. So with this as the end goal, I would like to thank you for your attention. And we're back again with uh, Professor Mons Blanke uh, in the other chair. Welcome, Mons, and thanks for that uh, enlightening speech. Uh, you talked a little bit about the ambitions in this project, but is it? Uh, could you put put a few more words on that? Uh, where are we going with this in in maybe one or five years? Our ambition is to do something good for society, and something spectacular to enhance safety, and that would also be good research. The safety and reliability, dependability of autonomous system is so important. It's unimaginable um, how fast autonomous systems would fail in the opinion of the public if we have just a single accident. Our ambition to the need of society is, first of all, to enhance safety, as I mentioned on the slides, to make a more comfortable life for navigators so that the bridge on the ship could be periodically and conditionally unattended, that navigators don't have to be at watch necessarily at two o'clock in the night at the middle of the sea where nothing happens. And if something should happen, then they should be called back on the bridge by the automated system and asked to make a decision of what to do. So that is decision support and what is called man in the loop. Man on the loop would mean that there's no navigator on board the vessel, but a small ferry is sailing. It has a supervisor, as I explained, and this supervisor keeps track of are there unexpected events where a human is needed, then it will call for assistance. This assistance could be on shore or it could be on another vessel. One person could supervise several ferries. And why do we want these ferries? Denmark is a country with many, many islands. Islanders tend to leave the islands. Uh, young people go away, they leave the islands. And part of the issue is transportation, lack of transportation facilities between the small islands and the mainland. We and Danish ferry operators envisage a situation where small, cheap vessels could make a kind of a taxi service that was not so expensive because boats are small they wouldn't need manning 24-7. And that would be a great benefit for pendlers on the islands for transportation of goods when you need it and not at regular two-hour intervals, which is what is happening today. Size of the boat could be flexible, and therefore we hope that this will benefit to the development of society and research together. That's our ambition. It sounds really exciting, and especially if you're living on a small island, you must uh, be uh, looking very much forward to this kind of ferry on demand. Uh, so thanks a lot, Mons, for these, uh, this insight into the exciting project on autonomy at sea. So the next topic that we will be uh, looking into is autonomous agricultural systems. And uh, as we will be uh, facing uh, difficulty in feeding the world, we need to uh, automate and uh, use new smart systems in order to enhance production of food. So uh, Lazarus uh, will uh, give insight into, uh, into this in the video that we'll show now. Hello, everyone. My name is Lazarus Nalpandidis. I'm an associate professor at DTU 
and I'm here to present you our research on autonomous agricultural systems. As human species, we have been exercising agriculture for thousands of years in order to secure the food and the raw materials that we need. However, the population of Earth is growing and we expect to be around 10 billion people by the year 2050. Furthermore, our agricultural activities have a huge impact on the environment. We need to produce more food than ever and what's more, we need to produce it in a more sustainable manner because we will need even more food in the near future. To deal with those challenges, there is a need for a new agricultural production paradigm to produce more with less resources. A solution, a possible solution to this situation is by automating the industry and introducing more robots in the production. The introduction of autonomous robotic systems in agriculture has the potential to increase productivity while reducing the, the influence, the negative influence we have on the environment. There are two archetypical approaches of obtaining agricultural robotic systems. One is to further develop the robots that we are developing in our labs and making them uh, applicable in uh, real life scenarios. And the other is to work with the already existing reliable agricultural machinery in order to endow them with intelligence and perception capabilities. Let's start with the robots that we have in our labs and they're trying to make it in the grasslands. Let's take as an example the case of detecting weeds on grasslands. We are working as DTU in this European project called Galirumi together with many other European partners. And our goal there is to develop small autonomous robots that we will provide as a service to the farmers. And those robots will be able to detect a specific weed, for example, Rumex, as you can see it here, and treat it in a herbicide free manner, for example, by electrocuting it or by laser based defoliation. Here is how Rumex looks in reality. Here is a grassland that has been invaded by this weed, Rumex, and cows are using this grassland to feed themselves. The more Rumex cows consume, the quality of their milk deteriorates. But how can you detect Rumex in order to control it? It's a computer vision nightmare, right? It's a green target on a green substrate. So deep learning can provide elegant solutions to this type of problems, but deep learning is notorious for requiring a lot of training data. We need to gather and manually annotate me thousands and thousands of images in order to let an algorithm know how a Rumex plant looks like. And this is how annotation looks like. We take each image one by one and then we start showing the computer how the, what is the leaf and what is the background. And we need to do this for every leaf for thousands and thousands of images. So as you can imagine, this is a notoriously time-consuming task. Could we improve and speed up this process by having some mask proposals that we can use as a starting point, then our task will only be to just correct and fix the small details that our proposals had missed. If we take this approach, we save a lot of time and we are done annotating an image faster than before. So that would speed up the annotation process and make deep learning usable. How do we come up with those proposals? We have performed research and uh, we found out that we can use like a handful of pre-annotated leaves. Now we have nine leaves here and then some weed-free background images. What we can do is we can take those leaves and superimpose them on the background and create artificial plants. So we can use those synthetic images and we can produce many of those synthetic images and we can use them to train a deep neural network. Once trained, this neural network can be fed with real images of real Rumex plants and those proposals will emerge as the output. We have tried our approach to both Rumex but also some other weed and the results are looking really promising. On the other strand, we are working with the big manufacturers of agriculture machinery. We're working with ACO, who are the producers of the big combined harvesters and tractors. And we're working with them to mount cameras and other sensors on their tractors. For example, you can see some example images taken from uh, cameras on board their tractors. And we can use like state-of-the-art deep learning approaches like this segment here to perform semantic scene segmentation. So that means that for each pixel of this image here, we can tell what this pixel belongs to. Does it belong to vegetation, grass, ground, crop or obstacle? Then the tractor is able to understand what's in its environment and react accordingly. Here we have a video of a tractor 
equipped with cameras that moves around and it detects obstacles as it moves. And of course, this is sped up, a tractor doesn't go as fast. But by detecting those obstacles, the tractor can find out what is a free space that it can move with safety. And big static objects is not the only thing that we're interested in, right? Humans should be avoided. So in order to, to ensure safety, this robot is equipped with stereo cameras that look around it and then they detect the existence of humans and allow the robot to plan its next actions in a safe manner. And I refer to robots and tractors interchangeably here because we make robots out of tractors. In our research, we are addressing several of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we are believing that we can perform this research and make this world a better place. But we also do this research because it's quite fun to deploy technology in the grasslands. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And we're back here at the library at the DTU. And with me in the other chair, I have uh, uh, I have uh, Lazarus Nalpantidis. Welcome, Lazarus. Hi, Ole. I, I hope that we can uh, talk a little bit about the ambitions behind the projects that you're doing in agriculture, or that we are doing in agriculture, to be more correct, maybe. Sure, sure. Agriculture is a very interesting. Uh, uh, target domain for deploying robots. It's a really challenging one. Mm. One has to deal with real nature, right? You cannot control the, the environment the way you can do it in a lab or in a factory hall. You need to make sure that your system is robust enough so it can operate for long periods of time because finding out that something is broken while on field is not the easiest uh, situation to find yourself in. So that makes agriculture a really challenging domain for robots. We are testing a number of sensors. I have been focusing on uh, cameras in, uh, in my talk, but obviously once in the fields, you need to gather as much information as you can possibly do. So in that sense, we are equipping our robots, and here we have one of those robots. We are equipping them with cameras, laser sensors, all sorts of sensors that would make sense uh, in uh, in a, for our scenario. So the major challenge is that's the reliability aspect. I would say, and that will also be highlighted later on in the program today, reliability is a big thing. You need to be sure that your robot will operate. And the environment is also many times not your friend, right? You need to be able to cope with whatever environment the weather is, is, uh, is uh, having for you. So you need to take it and you need to prepare for that. It's just like the farmers, they need to cope with the weather as it is. So thanks a lot for that insight, uh, Lazarus. And the uh, next topic that we selected out of, again, the many topics that we have uh, in the group is uh, autonomous inspection systems where uh, we will have a, a video where Evangelos Bukas will explain some of the aspects that, and some of the potentials that we have in this, uh, in this area. So uh, let's see the video. Inspection is a critical procedure for all infrastructures, with application spaces varying from nuclear power plants to underwater tanks of large vessels Inspections are mainly performed manually by human inspectors. While some parts of the inspection procedure have been automated, the vast majority of tasks still happen manually. Lately, researchers have developed robots to automate the procedure of inspection. I'm Evangelos Bukas. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering here at the Technical University of Denmark. In this short video, I will present the latest developments in the field of autonomous robotic inspection. DTU is no stranger to developing hardware and mechanisms for robotic inspection. For example, the drone behind me has been developed to touch, maintain contact and read sensor measurements from ultrasonic devices. The drone on the top has been designed to inspect high voltage power lines. However, in the case of autonomous inspection, it's the software which is most critical. From low level control to high level perception, machine learning and autonomous navigation, it is our algorithms which constitute the differentiating factor when we want to develop reliable, accurate and objective results. Let me explain by presenting an example 
of a research project which I coordinate here at DTU, namely the Inspectron project. The Inspectron project is funded by the Innovations Fund Denmark, and we execute this project together with our partners, Force Technology, Lloyd's Register, and Northern. The Inspectron project tackles the difficult task of inspecting ballast tanks and cargo tanks of large vessels. Those vessels undergo great stress, and therefore defects can arise. Lloyd's Register and other classification societies have developed systems for inspecting those tanks. You can see here our operation area. On the right side, you can see the cross-section of a tanker, and on the left side, you can see the cross-section of a bulk carrier. Here, you see the inside of a ballast tank, uh, the topside tank of a bulk carrier. We have reconstructed this area in the, our facilities so that we can test more regularly. On the left hand, you can see our uh, mock-up, and on the right hand, you can see the real. Here is an overview of our approach. We start from the right side, where we have a remote expert which gives high-level commands, and then we have our drone, which is fully autonomous. The drone can navigate autonomously into these areas by using its onboard sensors. We can perform localization, we can perform autonomous navigation, and machine learning for detecting the defects. When it comes to localization, it's a difficult task to have absolute localization inside the tanks. When you work outdoors, you can use GNSS, like RTK GPS or GLONASS, but here you can rely only on your own sensors. To provide absolute localization, that is a location with regards to the body frame of the ship, we use landmarks that are visible in the ship. Let me explain. Our sensors are fitted into a visual inertial odometry algorithm, which provides relative localization, and then the detection of landmarks is fused again to create absolute location. When we have the absolute location, we can detect the defects with regards to the body frame of the ship. Here, you can see where the landmarks are located on the real ship, and here you can see how our system detects them. The landmarks that you are using are structural landmarks, for example, these longitudinal frames uh, on the web frames of the ballast tanks. You can see here a video of our system working. So, initially the robot starts outside of the tank, and you can see uh, how the, the robot is tracked with uh, uh, localization inside the tank. You can also see the 3D reconstruction, which is produced by our sensors. What is important to see is this absolute correction here. This is the frame which converts our localization from relative to absolute based on the landmarks that we just explained. The next step is advanced navigation. The problem with ballast tanks is that they are confined spaces. So we have to do special procedures to navigate. Starting, we can detect the confined spaces. For example, here is the detection of uh, some holes. The next step is to navigate the robot in front of the passage. You can see here, using visual servoing, we can command the robot to go in front of the hole. In this video, you can see the approach that we follow for passing through the hole. Even though we don't see the hole, we can still go through by using visual landmarks on the images. The last step is machine learning. The problem here is that inspection is not objective. There are some rules, like the ones that you see here, for classifying an area as good, fair, or poor by the percentage of corrosion in the image. But you can see here that the results of what is fair or what is poor, they are not objective. We have envisioned two hierarchical approaches for classifying the tanks. The first approach starts with doing a condition category in the beginning, that means saying whether it's good, fair, or poor on the whole image, and then it locates the defects only on those images that have been recognized as Faulty. The second one starts by locating the defects in all the images and then calculates the percentage of corrosion so that we can do continuous category. The second approach has been proven to be much more reliable. You can see here an example of the detection of two kinds of uh, defects. One is edge corrosion and the other is 3D deformation. We call this buckling. I didn't do this job by myself. I want to thank Rune, Rasmus, Luca and Martin for the nice work they have done. And please go and uh, look at our papers that we published recently on IEEE SSRR. Thank you for attending this presentation. And if you have any questions or you want to contact me in any way, you can use this email. So that was an interesting insight into the uh, inside of a ship. And uh, with me here in the DTU library, I have Evangelos Bukas. 
uh, who's uh, the PI on this project. Uh, maybe you can uh, put a few more words on the, the ambition and the challenges that you're facing uh, in general in these kind of inspection tasks. Yes, uh, those kind of inspections are hard to be performed by humans uh, and they are even harder to be performed by robots. The main issue is that the robots have to autonomously navigate in these environments. Those environments are enclosed, they are tight, and uh, sometimes you need to, to be comfortable to touch something. Uh, it's very hard to maintain nice localization and to be able to uh, continue your navigation when you have these kind of problems. In our case, we are using solutions uh, that don't rely on any external localization. It's only using its own sensors and using the predefined areas around it like the, the frames of the ship, etc. Uh, that's the main issue. And the other one is definitely the machine learning. It's really hard to accurately and objectively classify something as faulty, but it's still better to be able to have some false, uh, false uh, positives rather than looking at every image. Mm. It's amazing to see uh, uh, research going into sort of real-world problems and sort of proving that it's it's actually worth uh, doing. Uh, do you see any other domains that this could be used in? Yeah, I mean, uh, apart from this, this technology that we develop, mm -hmm. they're not only for inspection. These are, uh, we just choose those problems that are harder uh, to solve because then we can apply them in other, in other fields. Uh, we can automate the procedures of uh, uh, integrating uh, uh, bigger, larger maintenance systems. So instead of just inspecting and seeing what's going on, we can actually interact with the environment as well, go and touch with, uh, with drones. Mm -hmm. We're using drones just because it's a harder problem. You don't have your gr the ground beneath you. So you really, really have to be very accurate in your operation. And the reliability is probably also very important. Reliability is, is one big factor. Uh, this example for this, uh, the, the inspection, uh, when you are down to 23 meters inside this dark area, uh, if the robot fails, there is no way, like you have to go downstairs manually and you cannot do that all the time. Uh, but if you applied it in a nuclear factory, for example, this kind of operation would be really, really bad. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Evangelos, for that uh, exciting insight into your research. So the next topic that we picked is uh, a really new one at the uh, DTU, it's uh, the topic of neurorobotics, and uh, Sylvia Tolu has prepared a video of, uh, explaining some of the research that she does, and uh, she'll hopefully be in the chair in a moment. So uh, let's see the video now. Hello, my name is Sylvia Tolu, and I am the coordinator of the neurorobotics team at DTU. In our lab, as you can see, we have both rigid and soft manipulator arms and modular robots that are used as testbed for our experiments in neurorobotics. Our main interest stems from the motivation to build agents that can autonomously act in a changing and unknown environments thanks to their embodied brain. Therefore, we have been developing brain-inspired adaptive control systems. As a result, we can understand how the brain works, manipulate it, and even recreate a pathological condition. In the future, this will lead to build robotic tools that will be used for assessment and even for rehabilitation of brain diseases. In neurorobotics, we study the brain of real agents, such as the mouse, and uh, the interaction of it with the environment. Therefore, we connect the simulated brain with the simulated and real agents. Brain simulations that are comprised of millions of neurons need uh, realistic body agents in order to perform and to reproduce accurately uh, data from neuroscience. And realistic brains embedded into realistic body agents need, at the same time, realistic or high-fidelity simulated environments. One of the most studied brain areas is the cerebellum, because the cerebellum is responsible for motor control and learning. The cerebellum is like a sensory area, and it's also a data-driven structure, which means that it doesn't have any program. We don't have a program, basically because our bodies change over time. In the next slides, I'm going to show you 
uh, the latest experiments we have carried out by embedding the cerebellum model into robots. The first example of brain embodiment is a work that we have done in collaboration with EPFL and uh, in this work uh, we wanted to reproduce the results from real mice during a locomotion task. The mouse you see in the video had to work on a split belt and had to adapt to a changing condition. So the velocity of one belt was modified during the locomotion task. We implemented a cerebella based control system based on hypotheses from the literature. Neuroscientists suggested that the cerebellum could perform a spatial adaptation. We hypothesized that this spatial adaptation comes from the cerebellum by modifying the pattern formation of the spinal central pattern generator. And the results we got confirmed that our control model was able to uh, reduce the errors and adapt the interlimb uh, parameters as demonstrated in experiments with real mice and humans. This other example is about mimicking learning mechanisms from living organisms. If you look at the video on the left, there is a, a guy making a very challenging task and you may be thinking that he has trained a lot. But what you may not be thinking is that this learning has uh, started when he was uh, a, a newborn. Since we are born, uh, we deploy what is called a motor bubbling, which is a, a random motion generation that covers the whole space and uh, leads to the formation of sensory motor maps. So by relying on such sensory motor maps and on the cerebellar uh, skills, humans are able to perform tasks in a very efficient and accurate way. In this work, in collaboration with uh, the Polytechnic of uh, Hong Kong, we have proposed a spike in neural network for approximating differential sensory motor maps and a spike in cerebellar model or controller to reach faster and accurate movements of a robotic arm. First, a course controller is built and trained through motor bubbling process. Feedback data from uh, proprioceptive and exteroceptive uh, sensors are encoded and fed into the input layer. Then, a spike in cerebellar controller is added to correct sensory readings and allow for movements with higher precision. The cerebellum is supervised by the error provided in task space. In the experiments, we carried out a typical visual servoing task to show that our spike in neural network is capable of handling noisy sensor reading to guide the robot arm through, uh, in real time. The cerebellum improves the servoing performance as the error decreases and the robot manages to have a more accurate and faster tracking performance as you can see in this video. Finally, I would like to thank all the collaborators involved in these experiments I showed to you and to all of you to listen to this presentation. Fascinating research. Uh, we're back at the DTU library with Sylvia Tolo in the other chair. So welcome, Sylvia. Thanks, Ola, and hello, everybody. It's uh, fascinating what you do here, but uh, I'm thinking, what kind of applications do you foresee for something like that in, in maybe some years? That's a good question, Ole. Um, first of all, I will say that uh, neurorobotics um, is uh, an holistic, uh, uh, applies an holistic approach. So it combines uh, um, computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence, 
and, uh, and biology, for example. And because uh, the goal we have is to open new paradigms in robotics, for example, uh, to uh, obtain uh, adaptive uh, control systems that can be applied in uh, uh, many fields, uh, and, but basically for obtaining um, um, uh, autonomy in uh, uh, different applications, um, such as inspection, for example. Um, for example, we are working at DTU now uh, for a, a new domain in underwater robotics, mm -hmm. and for that we are really uh, creating an inter interdisciplinary uh, project uh, in which we bring um, knowledge from uh, microelectronics, uh, uh, material scientists, uh, computational neuroscientists, um, electrical engineers, of course, to build uh, um, a neuromorphic uh, hardware mm -hmm. that can be embedded uh, on, on the robots, and the robot can then uh, leave it alone uh, in order to uh, go uh, far away, uh, and, for example, under the sea, mm -hmm. and to inspect uh, installations, and, uh, and to perform actions, uh, and to learn how to, to perform those actions. So basically, uh, what do we do is uh, to leverage uh, robotic embodiment uh, for uh, um, uh, really uh, um, uh, understand and to build and to, and to study um, neurobiological models of learning. Mm -hmm. So if systems uh, become intelligent, intelligent then uh, we can really have them to um, interact with the changing uh, context, mm -hmm. uh, environments, even with human beings. So this means uh, that in the future, uh, we will have artificial systems such as robots uh, interacting with us, and at the same time, we can use robots as a tool for understanding ourselves as well, and understanding our brain. Mm -hmm. And if we understand our brain, then we can even understand when our brain doesn't work. And so I foresee that uh, we will uh, use the robot as a tool for rehabilitation of brain diseases. This is another application, for example. It's fascinating uh, to get inside into this and uh, go from maybe the te technological side into the neuro robotic uh, side and then have an insight into that. Thanks a lot for your uh, presentation, uh, Sylvia. The final topic that we had uh, room for in this uh, short uh, webinar is uh, Playware. And it's presented by Professor uh, Henrik Hauterblun. And uh, we'll see a video and then when we come back to the library here, we will hear some, uh, uh, some thoughts from Henrik on, uh, on the development of, of uh, this field. So let's uh, see the video. Playware is intelligent hardware and software for play. Uh, we do this at DTU to create technology for people. Uh, we have the strategy to work towards creating sustainable value and welfare in society. And, and uh, particularly we, for Playware, do this through the Playware ABC, try to create technology for anybody, anywhere, anytime by B, building bodies and brains that should facilitate that people can construct, combine and create. Um, play is important here because play is a free and voluntary activity that we do for no other purpose than play itself. We know that when we are in play, we forget about time and place, forget about our fears and limitations. Uh, so we can motivate people to interact with our uh, technology, our robotic technology through play, and then measure if there is a collateral effect from that. Um, so we are combining uh, knowledge from humanities and arts on uh, play and play culture, human motivation with more technology uh, subjects uh, like studying modern AI, modular robotics, uh, user interfaces. Synthesize this to create uh, design uh, principles and then bring this out in society. Uh, you have uh, probably known that from, from the Lego robots that we help uh, Lego 
created back in the 90s uh, to study things about minimal robot system, user-friendly system, and so forth. Uh, and um, using that modular approach from Lego, we also created uh, things like self-reconfigurable uh, robots, shape-shifting robots like the H1 uh, modules here on uh, this image. And if we look at some of these people here doing that for many years, so for instance, in the center, you have Esten Östergård, who you know, took some of these principles that we've been studying for many years related to user-friendly minimal uh, robot systems to create a system where you don't need programming experience and created the universal robots for the industrial robotics market. So, so coming out from that tradition. Um, another example where we're using this to create technology for uh, robotic technology for anybody, anywhere, uh, anytime are the Fable robots that are user configurable robots that you quickly can put together, click, click, click to create a robot where you have different modules, uh, sensors, actuators, and construction modules. You can quickly uh, put this together within seconds. You can easily program those through a graphical programming interface and, and have a, a, a suitable system for an educational sector when you want to go beyond what you had in, in the Lego Mindstorms uh, in the past. Um, so you can create these uh, robots uh, quickly in, in the classroom. You can look more into this at shaperobotics.com. Um, so this is the, a typical example of how we create a technology for anybody, anywhere, anytime by building bodies and brains that facilitate that, in this case, the students can construct, combine, and create. We took the same um, inspiration for modular robotics uh, and combined that with Lego to create a system for physical uh, training. In this case, we wanted to, uh, to make a system that mediates playful social interaction, bring happiness and quality of life and allow people to regain, retain and increase their skills. Not like assistive robotics that assist you to do something. Here we want you to increase your skill to do your own uh, things in your daily life. Uh, and this can, for instance, be seniors with dementia. You can see here how this is uh, like a modular Lego blocks. You can put the tiles out on the ground in different physical topologies, and by that create different interactions amongst the users. Uh, you can put them next to a chair if you don't have a walking bar and, and uh, use it anywhere any time. Uh, you can use it with more people at the same time to create social play like here for seniors. Uh, in Finland uh, with dementia and they're playing a music game and, and they can uh, play five or six people at the time on the same set that you just lay out in different topologies. When we have this, we also do randomized control trials to, uh, to look at the effect. Uh, for instance, here we took uh, seniors average age 83 years old and find that if they come and play two times per week for 13 minutes every time, they increase their balancing test score by a staggering 149%. They also increase their leg strength, uh, mobility, and, uh, and agility. Um, so we know it's good for the physical health. With Hitachi, they're doing brain scanning with near-infrared with this uh, spin-off company, Noi, while the seniors are playing the games. And we can also do standard cognitive tests while they're doing uh, so, for instance, here from Shanghai with Shanghai Isao, who um, looking again at seniors playing a total of uh, five hours on the tiles over 10 sessions and find that they improve their um, score on standard cognitive tests in terms of reaction time and also the accuracy in the impact test, the memory test. So we know it's good for the body and the brain. Now, having that, we can have many people around the globe to play this game, collect the data and do big data analysis to look at what is the nominal score for somebody playing the game. So for instance, in this case, if somebody who's 60 years old is only scoring 15 points on this particular game, we can see that it's well below the nominal score and maybe the system needs to recommend some certain things. It does a, um, a performance analysis. It, the system can automatically do a risk analysis give a recommendation to what kind of games should be played so there's an automatically generated personalized training protocol. And then that can be brought into the seniors in the private homes, uh, for instance, for home rehab, like 
uh, with this older lady, 95 years old from uh, from Finland, and she can play in her living room or anywhere. Again, this is like the modular robotics inspiration. You can take the modules and put them anywhere and put them in different topologies. Take them into the middle of Africa, deep rural areas in Tanzania and Mozambique, where we're doing things with children with uh, cerebral palsy who are crippled and so forth. Uh, finally, um, we, we have seen that we can take inspiration from biology on the body and brain relationship to inspire our robotics, but we can also go the other way and use robotics to optimize biology control and optimize uh, the growth of life. Here in this case, we make the GrowBot a robotic system for growing food with sensors and actuators so you can optimize, you can parameterize the growth uh, um, in, um, in recipes. So in this case, our robotic system, we make that and make that well, but we also focus on the next step of the human robot interaction and finally the environment that we put this in into an educational system in this case. So we have a comprehensive systems design where everything is ready for the teacher to use, ready for the students to program in the graphical programming language, analyze the data and, and uh, look at the food that they're growing. So in this way, we are making technology for people and try to create sustainable value and welfare in society. And with me in the, chair, in the other chair, I have uh, Henrik hautrup Lund. Thanks for that uh, insight, Henrik, and congratulations on the prize you won recently. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Ole. Um, that's true. We just uh, won what is uh, termed uh, nicely uh, the Oscar of the Elder Care, uh, due to uh, some of the work you have seen here with, uh, with the modular tiles. Um, um, because uh, we can find this, uh, this evidences that it's good for the body and the brain. So, so this is important. This is important why we do this as, as research and, and not just deploy things. Through the research, we can do things like the randomized control trials. We can actually show which things are good and which things are bad with the machines, whatever the robots or, or the... the the things that come out of the robotics here. So, so that's important. So we know that this is, uh, is good for training the seniors, and therefore it's being deployed now around the globe in, in Asia, in Africa, in the, the Americas, and in Europe. Um, and that's important because um, new technology can bring uh, new, uh, new things to people. And I think this is, this is what we can see here, that, that we are we're able to create technology, we're able to evaluate the technology, we're able to ensure people that the technology is good. Whether, as we have seen, it being for the autonomous ships, whether it's being for the neuro rehabilitation that Sylvia talked about on, on, in our case here, through this uh, rehabilitation, through uh, physical interaction. So that's important, that, that we can use our research labs to ensure that the technology that we bring out in society is actually for the good of people. That's completely true, and, uh, and I especially like the last sort of twist that you have in your video about the robot. So I look forward to having this kind of tomato robot in my fridge so I can harvest new tomatoes every morning. Uh, yes. Don't you see a potential in that uh, beyond uh, schools and teaching? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, uh, the thing is that that when we can when we can build up a uh, a mini greenhouse for the household as a robotic system, then it gives us a lot of opportunities because we know all of our techniques from uh, from machine learning, from optimizing. Uh, robotic controllers, now we, are, we just have a closed system like that, like a robotic system where we are optimizing the interaction with uh, the living uh, matter, uh, and thereby we are optimizing the, the growth and living conditions of the living matter. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of food, this is, uh, this is interesting. As we heard earlier as well from, uh, from the outside field, that it's important when we, when we are more people in the world. Of course, also, if we can bring this into the household, into your, 
your kitchen at home, and, and I do believe that we'll be able to see that over the next decade, that in the household, as well as we have a fridge, we could have a household uh, greenhouse to, uh, to grow our own, uh, own food. That's fascinating, Henrik. Thank you very much for joining us. So now we have uh, another story coming up, and uh, the other topic is this uh, usage of uh, competitions as a driver for the research, but also as a way of uh, engaging and activating the students in really learning uh, the underlying theory, because that's the way they can actually perform uh, in, the, uh, in the competitions. So we've been uh, in several competitions, and uh, it's great fun, by the way, if you don't know that. Uh, and uh, the last one we attended was the uh, MPSIRC, Mohammed bin Said uh, Robotic Challenge in Abu Dhabi in February, where we actually came back from Abu Dhabi just before we closed down here in Denmark. So it was extremely well planned. Uh, and uh, we got home with a silver medal, a bronze medal, and a fourth place overall. And that's uh, against 30 of the best universities in the world in robotics. So we are really happy about that. And we're looking forward to the next edition of the competition in 2023. But uh, we prepared a small video of the different competitions. So let's see that now. Robot competitions is a very good way to try out if your research methods actually work in reality. It also gives you a good um, way to compare with the level of competitors, that is other universities or fellow students. And it also has one very important lesson to learn you. It doesn't matter if your system is working tomorrow or yesterday, it must work at competition day. For these reasons, DTU Electro has participated in several robot competitions in the world and also DTU Electro is arranging a mobile robot competition itself which runs every year. DTU RoboCup is arranged once every year just after Easter and is a mobile robot competition where you have to go through a track solving several obstacles and it's targeted to DTU students but also pupils from high school can attend. Actually one from high school won three years in a row. We can see the robot here going through the track, trying to solve the different obstacles. For example, you can see here it's picking up a golf ball and putting it in a hole. The 
can also see here a robot opening a gate, going through it and closing the doors after it. You can have up to 28 points, but normally uh, the best will get around 25, 26. Another competition on the student level is Field Robot Event. In that, robots autonomously have to solve several problems in a row crop, going through the row crop, maybe looking for weed and spraying on it, and as you see on this video, actually sowing weed. You can see here that it goes in and automatically fills up with the new grain and then go and put the sowing machine into the ground and actually sowing the wheat grains. On the research level, we have participated in the Shell Ecomart and where the idea is to try to let the vehicles go as far as possible on a given amount of fuel and also newly the autonomous part has been added to the competition. Here you see the vehicle going towards the field. The biggest competition that we are participating in is the Mohammed Ben Sayed International Robot Challenge, which takes place every third year. It's a huge competition with elite universities all over the world. Up to 30, 40 teams are participating, having on average more than 10 members each. The price level is also quite high, like 2 million kroner for each challenge and 7 million for the main challenge. So there's something to go for there. Here you see one part of one of the challenges 2019 which is called balloon popping but it is detecting flying objects and it's accepting them. Another challenge in Empezirk this year is the wall building. The robot has autonomously to pick up the different blocks of different sizes and different colors and take them and build a wall. And you can see our solution here. The robot is actually loading a whole layer of bricks onto itself so that it doesn't have to go back and throw too many times, which would be time consuming. Maybe you can see in the solution that the robot actually feels the walls when it's charging the blocks into the robot itself using force feedback from the robot arm. As you have seen, DTU Electro has participated in many competitions and as you see here, often with a good result.
And last but not least, it's a lot of fun participating in competitions. at DTU and with me I have Lazarus Nalpantidis and uh, this uh, part of the session is on Q&A and uh, we've had tons of questions uh, but uh, we can only, the time is running so we have just one question Esma, can you uh, relay that? Uh, yes, we have one question for uh, Lazarus. Has the group D2 worked on how to deal with or kill army worms in addition to the weed where computer vision was required? Would this be easier? I think that's a very good question. That's, that's a very logical next step. Once you are there in the fields with cameras and you can observe the weeds, you can probably also observe like the, the little animals and the, the worms in, in the environment. We have not performed this. We are focusing on weed detection and um, that, that could be the next step. For example, there are many applications, for example, in strawberry cultivation where such, such a, a detection system would be very, very useful. But uh, for the time being, we are focusing on the weed detection. So, uh, Lazarus, uh, what about the uh, involvement in this? If people are sitting out behind the screens and thinking, how can I become part of this? What would you say to them? I think in most of the videos that we have shown, Ole, we have a lot of faculty members and researchers, but we have a lot of students as well. And I guess, depending on the seniority level, people are very welcome to join us as colleagues, right, applying for a PhD position or some positions that we announce from time to time and now people know more or less some of our research themes. But uh, we are also having a lot of master students who come and join and many of and some of those are actually staying with us afterwards. So we have this new master's education in autonomous systems where we're combining robotics with AI and machine learning, trying to make robots more intelligent, but also try to develop agents, not necessarily robotic agents, but also like software agents that are capable of like performing autonomously. Uh, other than that, we are also heavily involved in uh, yet another master education uh, in uh, robotics technology under electrical engineering, where we are focusing more on the hardware aspects of that. And depending on like what each one finds more interesting and more challenging for him or her. There is an ample uh, range of possibilities to choose from. I think that's a great opportunity for all of you out there who want to, uh, to join. So um, I think we are running out of time now, so I'd like to round off with a few slides. Uh, and uh, this is the third of four uh, webinars in this series. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge some of the other uh, collaboration partners that we have. You've seen a lot of them in the videos, but we have a lot of collaboration. So if you're out there and seeking some uh, good uh, researchers to collaborate with, uh, we, are, we are able and uh, ready to, to help you. But the main resource that we have, of course, is our good staff that are, have been performing wonderfully in these very difficult conditions uh, in the last uh, months. So, uh, so really a great and big thanks to everybody in the automation and control group. So you're probably wondering what will the fourth of the four be about? The fourth webinar will be a panel discussion between robotic companies in Denmark, uh, academia, and uh, it will take place on the 27th of January. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's exciting to see uh, what we will uh, talk about at that time. I think it will be something about getting this research out into companies and actually innovating the, uh, the uh, robotic and autonomous system field. I think it was mentioning that uh, the initial scheduled date was mm -hmm. uh, in December, but we have received feedback about uh, this being a very crowded period with a lot of webinars. So we thought like we should give it some time, 
we should all get some time to breathe and then schedule this uh, fourth and uh, concluding webinar uh, in the new year, giving us all a little bit more time to reflect upon the themes that were presented at DTU, at Sudansk University, at the University of Southern Denmark and at Talborg University in the previous episodes. Yes, so uh, I think we'll uh, say thank you very much for attending. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to contact us uh, at uh, this or one of the other mail addresses. And season's greetings also to all of you in this, uh, in this time. So uh, now, over to you, Henrik. Wow, Ole. That was really impressive. I'm very happy to see all this cool research going on at DTU across autonomy, but very much engaging the students, modern infrastructure, fundamental new research. That's very nice. I really appreciate that. This wraps up our tour of the main academic institutions in Denmark that are doing robotics research. There are a number of places we didn't have a chance to go to, but I think you get the overall drift of all this research going on. What, what is happening? Why is it impacting this? We have a fourth seminar where we will try and talk about why is it that Denmark is not only successful at doing fundamental new research, but also incredibly successful at translating this into real world products. So we're assembling a panel of people that sort of represents the different actors in the ecosystem to talk about what, what does it take to translate this? What does it take in terms of money? What does it take some idea? What does it take, take in terms of entrepreneurship to make this truly successful? We'll get this together. We will try and give you the, the full picture of why is it that Denmark is one of the fastest growing robotics ecosystems in the world today. We hope you'll join us all than that. I can only say I hope you're staying safe and healthy out there. We look forward to seeing you again and have a nice day.